Father, we thank you at this time. We bless your name. We know you are a mighty God, a never-failing God, a loving God, mighty and powerful. And you come to give total freedom, complete freedom, full freedom unto your people. And I pray that here today, none will remain empty-handed in Jesus' name. Amen. Magnify yourself in every life. Glorify yourself in every family. And I pray you put joy, happiness, and the hope of glory in every life in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because I know it's done. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. As we come today, we need to understand what we have got already so that we'll be able to make use of the knowledge of what we have received living in the fullness of Christ by faith the life we live from today from now on in the strength of the Lord in the joy of the Lord we want every step every moment to see us walking, abiding, living in the fullness of Christ. And all that we do by faith. The topic today, living in the fullness of Christ by faith. Galatians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Understand that. After you've given your life to the Lord, Christ in his love, in his strength, in his power, in his unction, in his abiding might and strength enters into you. And now you are not empty. And your throne, the throne of your heart, is not vacant anymore. You are now living in the faith, by the faith, through the faith of the Son of God. It says, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, not when we get to heaven, here on earth, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Be conscious of that every time, that you are not living the ordinary life you used to live. You are now living in the faith, by the faith, and through the faith of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us in Colossians chapter 3, from verse 1, it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, dead, crucified with Christ, dead with Christ, risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Your affection is changed. Your mindset is changed. The direction of your life is changed. You are now living the way Christ would live if Christ were here on earth. And he says, because you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And then he says in verse 2, set your affection. Set your love, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. It says in verse 3, it says, For ye are dead, and your life is seed with Christ in God. And now verse 4 says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. You have started in grace 
you will end in glory. You have started with Christ. You will reign with Christ in Jesus' name. Living in the fullness of Christ by faith. The three things we're going to look at as we talk about living in this fullness of Christ by faith. One, salvation. Two, sanctification. Three, service. Number one, life converting salvation by personal faith. Life converting salvation by personal faith. Number two, love confirming sanctification. Sanctification gets us to the point we love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. We love our neighbor as ourselves and we love the believers as Christ has loved us. Number two, love confirming sanctification by purifying faith. Number three, Lord compelling service. The service that is not a man pushing you. It's not a man driving you. It's not circumstance propelling you to serve. You serve because the Lord that lives and abides in you, he compels you. Lord compelling service with prevailing faith. Let's come to number one. Number one is the life converting salvation by personal faith. There are many people that talk about salvation. They know about salvation. But they wonder, by the way, what is this salvation? It is good for you to understand what you have. If you don't know what you have, you will not know the expectation of heaven upon your life as you are saved. Look at Acts chapter 16, reading from verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? There's some preachers that will answer that question by saying, you do nothing. Just accept. You do nothing. Just hold on to it that you are saved. Just confess that you are saved. What must I do? You repent. You turn away from your sin. You look at Christ who died for you on the cross at Calvary. And you believe in your heart. Repent and believe. Then you are saved. Now, that's salvation. What does it translate to? If you write that word salvation is sins blotted out by God. When you are saved, the meaning of being saved is that God takes the blood of Christ and wipes away all the sins you ever committed, blots everything out, cleanses everything completely. Look at Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. That's salvation. That your sins may be blotted out. S sins blotted out by God. A, abominations burnt off for good, forever. Every abomination in your life, all those things that belong to the devil, the things that belong to the world, the things that will not help you in your race to heaven. Salvation means that A, abominations burnt off for good forever. 
Look at this in Acts chapter 19. Reading from verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Look at verse 19. It says, many of them also which use curious arts, demonic objects, occultic objects, idolatrous objects or materials, they brought their books and brought those materials together and burnt them before all men and they counted the price of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. And then in verse 20 it says, So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. That's salvation. When you say, I'm not a child of the devil anymore, I don't need the materials of Satan anymore, and all those regalias and everything of the devil of idolatry, I'm born again now, I hate them, I detest them, and you bring them together, and you bond them, and forget them forever and ever, never to come back into your life again, that's salvation, hell, life, brought out of bondage by grace your life was bound before you were bound to this or this or that and it was a habit that bound you but now you are saved as a result of that salvation l in that salvation translates to life brought out of bondage by grace galatians chapter 5 verse 1 it says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, he shall be free indeed. And all the things that tied you, all the chains that tied you, all the happiness that tied you down, they're now forever gone. Because salvation means life brought out of bondage by Grace, be there in salvation. Virtues burst with goodness. The virtue of the Lord is burst. That is, that your life now gives birth to the goodness of the Lord. The virtue will be there if you are really saved. You see, if you are saved, the works of the flesh are all destroyed. And then the virtue and the love of God will not be in your heart. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness and faith. Salvation will birth, will bring forth in your life love, hatred is gone. Joy being gloomy at every little thing. All that is gone. Being sad. If the sun rises in the morning, some people are sad. If it is raining, some people are sad. If normal things happen, people are sad. When you are saved, your life turns around. Love comes in. Joy comes in. You have the peace of God with you. Long suffering, you're able to endure gentleness. You're not like an high on hand, handling other people, not caring for their lives anymore. And goodness, you're good, you're good. And faith, faith in the Lord. And then in verse 23, we're told meekness and temperance against such there is no law. A in that word salvation means affection. Affection bent towards glory. Your affection will not be bent towards the nightclub. Your affection will not be bent towards corruption. Your affection will not be bent towards evil things now. Your affection, after you are saved and you are born again, your affection is bent towards glory. That's what we read in uh, Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. 
if ye there be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ seated on the right hand of God. And then in verse 2, it reminds us, set your affections on things above and not things on the earth. When we are saved, that she there means transformation born out of gratitude. Transformation born out of gratitude. Christ died for me. I am grateful. Christ gave all on the cross of Calvary. I am grateful. Christ surrendered and Christ suffered for me, even me. Because of that suffering and because of that surrender, submission of Christ, I am grateful. How do I show my gratitude? By the transformation that takes place. It tells us in Romans chapter 12 verse 1, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, the mercy that saved you, the mercy that blessed you and the mercy that took all your guilt away, all your condemnation away, the mercy that has prepared, provided heaven for you, and you are grateful. It says then that you present your bodies now a living sacrifice. Present your body a living sacrifice. What does that mean? You used to present your body to Satan, to the devil. He'll use your tongue to lie. He'll use your hands to fight. He'll use your legs to dance to the tune of the world. He'll use your ears to hear gossip and then use your mouth to spread the gossip. But now, he saved you. You have salvation. There is transformation now that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. That's salvation. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. I, in that salvation, is innocence. Innocence. Now, if they are causing trouble somewhere, you are innocent of that trouble. If they are dividing, scattering families of their neighbors, and we come to you, you say, I'm saved now. I'm innocent of the action that scattered their family. If they are causing riot in the place of work, and then they say, how about you? How about you? What's your part in this? I am innocent. I'm now a child of God. I don't cause trouble for any manager, any director, any leader any principle i don't cause uh, any trouble anymore for any family there is innocence begotten by the gospel innocence begotten by the gospel it tells us in psalm 19 verse 7 it says the law of the lord is perfect converting the soul and the testimony of the lord is sure making wise the simple and it is that now that sets us totally free and makes us innocent look at verse 13 in verse 13 keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins let them not have dominion over me then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent 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 from the great transgression oh is obedience based on his guidebook the guidebook for the christian is the bible the guidebook that points out to the way of heaven 
is the Bible. And now, as a child of God, you're saying that salvation means you have obedience that is based on the guidebook that leads us to heaven. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. But God be thanked that she were in the past servants of sin, but ye have obeyed, obeyed, obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. The doctrine was from the Bible, a righteous life, a pure life a practical obedient life and now it says you have obeyed that form of doctrine and you obeyed from the heart look at verse 18 in verse 18 it says being then made free from sin the freedom that he gives us is freedom from sin you became the servants of righteousness and then end naughtiness blocked out with godliness. Naughtiness will try to come in again. Stubbornness will try to come in again. Self-will will try to come in again. But now I am saved. Now I am transformed. Now the sins of the past they are cancelled and therefore there's no naughtiness anymore. If you're a real child of God, the naughtiness is blocked out with godliness. James chapter 1, we're reading from verse 18. In James chapter 1 verse 18, of his own will begat ye us, that means we are born again, with the word of truth. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And then in verse 19, therefore, my beloved brethren, saved souls, real believers, let every man be sweet to hear and slow to speak, slow to wrath. Verse 20, for the wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of God. Verse 21. In verse 21, wherefore lay apart, lay aside, abandon, reject, let there be a shield between you and filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Get it off your life. If you claim to be saved at home, in church, in the office, on the street, anywhere you are, naughtiness is blocked out with godliness. It says all the superfluity of naughtiness, get them off and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save uh, your souls. That's salvation. That's the meaning of salvation. That's the outcome of salvation. That's the experience of salvation. But you know, we want to live in the fullness of Christ by faith. And if we're going to live in the fullness, we'll move on from salvation to sanctification. Point number two now. In point number two, love confirming sanctification by purifying faith. Love confirming sanctification by purifying faith. It tells us in First Thessalonians chapter 5, reading from verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. And then in verse 23, and a God, the very God of peace, sanctify you. They were saved. A new experience was coming. The God of peace, who gave you peace already at salvation. Now he will sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, 
your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24 tells us faithfully see that calleth you who also will do it. He will do it. I said you will do it. Christians, believers, children of God should be concerned and passionate about sanctification. If you are truly saved and you know Christ died for you on the cross of Calvary that he might sanctify you and that God, the God of peace, desires and he wants to sanctify you soul spirit and body you'll be passionate about that you will not only say i believe it you will experience it you will not just say i preach it you will possess it and people can tell that the sanctification you preach is reflected in your life, private life, in your life, public life, in your life, ministerial life. Now, what sanctification? Look at that again. We're using the letters of the word sanctification to give you understanding so that I know when I say I am sanctified this is what it means as surrender all to christ surrender all to christ this grace of god comes to you and you see that christ surrendered everything you say yes lord i too i surrender all unto christ hebrews Chapter 11, verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son. You know the story. I don't need to repeat all the years that Abraham waited and this bundle of joy bundle of laughter became the symbol of all his possession and all the promises and prophecies that god had given him but sanctification makes us surrender all that is precious unto us a abstain from all appearance of corruption there is nothing in your heart anymore that is secretly desiring all the dregs and all the evil in the world. We're told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, reading from verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Understand? If you are saved, you don't need a policeman, a police deeper life official following after you and then you are looking back and you are looking here and there. The police deeper life policeman is there. I must not do this one now. Deeper life pastor is there. I must not get involved now. And then you are looking back and if the police pastor is no more there, now I can. You're not a real Christian then. If you're a real Christian, whether people know or they don't know, whether they see or they don't see, sanctification does a work of grace in your heart that anywhere you are, you abstain from evil. You abstain even from the appearance of evil. You abstain from all appearance of evil. And this sanctification in nature and affection 
of Christ likeness. Your nature is changed. Your nature is totally transformed. We're looking at Second Peter chapter one verse three. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Verse 4. In verse 4 it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Sanctification. Partakers of the divine nature. The nature in you is the nature in Christ. And what Christ will not secretly desire. You will not secretly desire. Whatever Christ will not have in his mind, in his spirit, his soul, and cover up. You will not cover up like that because everything is transparent. You're saved. You're sanctified. And he has given you the promise of the divine nature. And you have that nature in you. See his commitment to his new commandment. Commitment to his new commandment in John chapter 13, reading from verse 34. It says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Christ's love is not superficial. Christ's love is not artificial smile. Christ's love is not a pretending nice language. Christ's love is deep, is sincere, is transparent, is helpful. Christ's love is sacrificial. And when we are sanctified, then we have a commitment to that new commandment. Verse 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love, not erotic love, not sensual love, not fleshly love, Christ's love. Deep love, practical love, sympathetic love. If ye have love one to another, when we're sanctified, we're fully committed unto that. T is truthfulness in all communication. Sanctification is not make believe. Sanctification is something real, is something definite. If we don't have it, let's go back to Calvary. Let's go back to the Lord and live in the fullness of Christ so that we know here is sanctification and you are sanctified through and through. You have uh, the truthfulness in all your communication. We come to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. And that she put on the new man, which is after God, and is created in righteousness and true holiness. Not fake holiness. Not just word of mouth holiness. And then he tells us in verse 25, in verse 25, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man the truth with his neighbor for ye are for we are members one of another look at verse 29 in verse 29 let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth 
but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace to the hearers now when a sanctified man a sanctified woman talks to another person that person will feel the comfort of the spirit the joy of the lord the upliftment in his spirit he will minister grace to those who are hearing him i is integrity 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 in an afflicting crisis when a sanctified man a sanctified woman goes through a time of crisis came suddenly unexpectedly you know what will happen the integrity he had at the point of salvation sanctification that integrity will go through with him through the period of crisis we're told in job chapter 2 reading from verse 3 job chapter 2 verse 3 and the lord said unto satan as thou considered my servant job that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and is choice evil, and still holdeth fast his integrity. Sanctification. Holding fast his integrity. Complaint will not steal my integrity. Anger will not steal my in integrity. Misbehavior will not steal my integrity. The accusation of people, whatever they think about me, will not make me, okay, you say I'm bad, you have not seen what it means to be bad. You say I'm not worthy, you have not seen unworthiness yet. You say I'm not trustable, you have not, you have not seen anything yet. God, it's not my fault. My husband said I'm not trustworthy. My wife said I'm not dependable. And because they said that, I'm going to prove to them, my friend, you did not have integrity. And what happened only brought it out that you didn't have integrity. When that I, letter I, is missing in the spelling of sanctification, sanctification is no more there. You have to understand that all these attributes spell out sanctification in your experience. And God said, he still holds on to his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. F is freedom from the ancient carnality. F in the sanctification is the freedom from ancient carnality. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto the spiritual. I know you speak in tongues. I know you try to manifest some baby, childish gifts of the spirit. I know you try to copy this person and that person. There's somebody there who is having a headache. There's somebody there who says something, his ear is itching him. There's somebody there who says skin on the right leg is itching him. Uh-huh. But you are carnal. Carnal. And they have not been made free. From the carnality, the ancient carnality. I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes 
in Christ. Look at verse 2. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For he that too you were not able to bear it. Canal Christians, anything, whatever they want to hear, it's always about water, water of life. Always about milk, the milk of the word. But the meat of the word, why is the pastor preaching like this today? What we came for, we came for water, we came for milk. We don't want the meat of the word. If you only take milk every day, milk morning, afternoon, and evening, milk Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, milk every time, you'll be anemic. You'll not have all the nutrients you ought to have. And these people were carnal. And in their carnality, they rejected the meat of the world. They were not able to bear it. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, it says, For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife, they were not sanctified. Envy and strife. And then it says, And divisions. Divisions. Are ye not carnal and walk as men? I pray that real sanctification that we have been singing about for years, Jesus only and Jesus ever, Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, Coming King. I pray. That sanctification will be real in every life in Jesus' name. And then, as we talk about this sanctification, and we know we have to have integrity and freedom, I imprint the imprint of the image of Christ. That the image of Christ is imprinted in our spirit and it tells us in romans chapter 8 reading from verse 29 romans chapter 8 reading from verse 29 it says for whom he did for no he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son sanctification to be conformed to the image of his son that the life we live the thoughts we think the plans we make the decisions we carry out it will be like christ himself thinking and planning and deciding and carrying out everything because the image of Christ is imprinted in us. See, confirmation of the new covenant. The confirmation of the new covenant. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6. But now, as he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also... He is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, I'm finding fault with them. It says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord that I will make a new covenant of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah. And when that new covenant takes place, look at verse 10. In verse 10, it says this, is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind the sanctification i will put my laws he will do it 
It's not like, you know, uh, you know, the pastor telling his members, how many times am I going to emphasize this? How many times am I going to say this? We said this last year. We said this last month. Didn't you hear? Eh, I forgot. When it is written on your heart, you'll not forget. The law of God, the word of God, transferred from the brain to the heart. It says, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And then if there is attitude of acceptable contentment. Contentment. When we're sanctified, it gives us the attitude of contentment. But godliness with contentment is great gain. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. And T, there is transparency with an uh, attesting conscience. We have transparency. Your life is transparent. And the conscience bears you witness. In Acts chapter 24, reading from verse 16. And herein do I exercise myself. That's Paul the Apostle. Paul did not say, I'm a preacher, I'm an apostle, and a man of authority. No man can challenge me. I'm first class, first rate, number one apostle. I'm a law to myself. Others cannot touch that. Pastor, do you? Others cannot go there. Pastor, do you? Others cannot drink that, whether private or public. Leader, do you do that? I am number one. And there is no law that controls me. You know, the lawless people, you will not get to heaven. If you are so high, woman leader, if you are so high, pastor, brother, that you are not under the control of the word of God. And your conscience is dead. And your conscience is completely seared. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Once the conscience is gone, you'll be acting anyhow, talking anyhow, doing whatever you want to do. Your office, your position, takes the better part of you. That's all you ever think about. You're not thinking about transparency with your conscience attesting to it. And Paul the Apostle said, and hearing, do I exercise myself to have always... Sometimes others are there. Sometimes others are not around. Always. Sometimes you are by yourself. Sometimes there are people who are with you. Always in the private and in the public. Always having a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. The transparency of conscience will be there. I is identification with the actions of Christ. Whatever Christ will not do, I cannot do. Wherever Christ will not go, I cannot go there. Whatever Christ cannot say to a woman, I as a man cannot say to her, Whatever Christ will not discuss with a man. If you're a woman, whatever Christ will not discuss with them, you will not discuss with them. Eh, she's my mommy. Uh-huh, I hear you. 
She is my beloved sister. I hear you. But you know what's in your heart? When we're saved, when we're sanctified, we have identification with the actions of Christ. All that kind of sentiment you're hiding under mommy, mommy, uh, daddy, daddy, under uh, beloved sister, beloved brother, the Lord knows your heart. Sanctification will take away all those private things we're sharing together. It says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, but we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And then in verse 10, it says, For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory and to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Then in verse 11, look at the identification here. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one. Christ and the sanctified one the sanctifier and the sanctified they are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to be called or to call them brethren who oh, is one accord in conformity to Christ who oh, one accord in conformity to Christ there are people that you know go around and are blowing the trumpet I'm sanctified I'm sanctified they have a disagreeable spirit they have a disagreeable attitude they are always looking for something to criticize something to oppose and they're always looking at somebody who is standing to make him trip and to make him fall but you know when we're sanctified in line with the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is one accord in conformity with Christ. Look at John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. They were already saved. He said, Rejoice because your names are written in heaven above. The salvation beyond the salvation apart from the salvation he prayed for them now and he said sanctify them through thy truth the word is truth and then in verse 18 he says as thou hast sent me into the world even so have i also sent them into the world verse 19 tells us and for their sakes i sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth verse 20 says neither pray i for these alone but for them also which shall believe on me through their word look at verse 21 it said that they all may be one one accord in conformity to christ that they all may be one as thou father art in me and i in thee that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and newness with affirmed crucifixion Newness, newness of life, newness of thought, newness of behavior, newness of lifestyle, newness within and without, with affirmed crucifixion. Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 20, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. 
the old me is not alive anymore. The old me that will get angry at you know the stop, uh, snapping of the finger. The old me that is covetous. The old me that is traditional. The old me that you know everywhere watching over people, not watching over myself. The old me going in, arresting them, and committing them into prison. Not I anymore. Neither do I live anymore, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, the sanctification. And I pray that the Lord himself will do this deep work of sanctification in every life in Jesus name the son has taken away your voice over there yeah. amen it will do it will come to point number three now point number three is our service Lord compelling service with prevailing our faith the kind of service that is compelled by love. The service that God accepts. The service that God will reward is the service that is propelled and compelled by love. When you are compelled by the love of God and you say, Lord, here am I for what you've done for me. I'm saved. I'm sanctified. All I can do is to respond and pay in a little way because your love compels me. That is service. As we talk about service, what service is seeking the lost for Christ. Seeking the lost for Christ. If you are not seeking the lost, if you are just in one place there and you think you are serving God, you are not even interested in what people who are getting saved. You are not interested in counseling those who are getting saved. You are not interested in seeking out and going out to the people who are not saved to be saved. Jesus said in Luke chapter 19 verse 10, For the Son of Man, is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the service. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. If I were here every day, every moment, every time, at every opportunity, I'd be seeking to save that which was lost and you are there standing in for me representing me occupy until i come when we say there is service it means we exalt loyalty above convenience there are times the service will not be convenient but there is one word in us it is the word loyalty and we exalt that loyalty. He called me. And he expects me to be faithful. He called me. He expects me to be loyal. And we exalt loyalty above our convenience. In Acts chapter 20 verse 24. It says, but none of these things move me. None of these things move me. Persecution, pain, problem, whatever, and wherever it's coming from, none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my cause with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify, to preach, to proclaim the good news, the gospel of the grace of God. And we push all your discomfort behind 
seeking for convenience push all that behind you exalt loyalty above convenience and then are retaining retaining the landmarks without compromise you're not saying well salvation salvation we're not talking about repentance we want the people to be saved we're not talking about repentance how will they be saved without repentance we look for healing explosive miracle and people blind eyes opening the deaf hearing and the lame rising up and walking we're not going to talk about sin we're not going to talk about new life in christ we cannot talk about righteousness now this is the moment and this is the day of miracle you remove the ancient landmarks because you are in pursuit of miracle talk about everything the word for the whole world from the christ who has sent us in proverbs chapter 22 verse 28 remove not the ancient landmarks which thy fathers have said remove not the ancient landmarks which thy fathers have said Martin Luther evangelized, but still emphasized repentance, faith in Christ. John Wesley evangelized, and John Wesley saw great, great miracles. He still emphasized holiness, without which no man shall save the Lord, shall finish. Evangelized, and still emphasized the life a born again believer ought to live. That's what we do. We don't say this is a miracle time and this is a, you know, explosive time and therefore forget the old ancient landmarks. In serving the Lord, we retain the landmarks without compromise. It tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. Meditate upon these things and give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. And then in verse 16, verse 16 says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. You are evangelizing? Continue in them. And you are praying for people to have explosion of miracles continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. V is visualizing the Lord at his coming. What will he find in your hand? How will he meet you when he comes? As for serving the Lord, you are asking, will this be acceptable to him at his coming? Visualizing the Lord at his coming. In Luke chapter 12, verse 14. Be therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. In verse 41, then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us or even to all? Verse 42, and the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season. I increasing our labors through cooperation. Increasing our labors through cooperation. You're an evangelist, there are counselors, there are singers. The technical people, the ushers, you all cooperate together, work together in one accord so that 
your labor and the fruit of your labor will increase. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, I have planted Apollo's watered cooperation, but God gave the increase. See, calling the lawless out of eternal condemnation, calling the lawless. Those who act as if there were no law, no principle, no commandment from the Lord. There are men who act like that. I mean, the church, I just choose this as my church. As for all you're expecting to conform to the word of God, to live by the word of God, uh -uh, I didn't come here for that. They're lawless. Women who say they are part of the church, I hear that. I hear the emphasis on holiness, but I'm not here for that. I came just because, you know, my friend is here and I like to be here. You're not here. Your heart, your mind, your personality is not here. You're like, is that Jacob? I hear the voice of Jacob, but I feel the skin of Esau. Be a person that if you are there, you are there. You accept the word of God. To be in deeper light Bible church, you have to accept the Bible. Believe the Bible. Embrace the Bible. We're not looking for numbers of a mixed multitude. The people who say, I'm there. Aren't you happy, Pastor? I'm a member of your church now. I said I'm not happy yet until I see that evidence of salvation, that you are born again, that the power of the cross has effect upon your life. That is what the Lord expects. And I pray you'll be a real member of the church of the living God in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. And so the Lord wants us to get all those lawless people out of condemnation and bring them into the Lord. He is engaging in limitless liaisons for the great commission. I see brother dear is really born again. I didn't know him before. I said, come on, take my hand. We have a lot to do together. I see another person there, his sister there. And then I say, you are born again. What are you doing? There's a lot of work to do. Let there be limitless liaisons, joining hands together. And joining hands together, people of the same mind and people of the same concept. And they say, we're going to win our world for Christ. As you do that, all the grace, all the power, all the strength, all the might, all the anointing, all the unction, all the energy, divine energy you need, the Lord will grant unto you in Jesus' name. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, For do I be free from all men, yet I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. I bend low, I humble myself, I make myself a servant unto all that you and I, that we and them, that all of us may bring more souls into the kingdom. And then in verse 22, it tells us in verse 22, it says, to the weak became I as weak, and I don't push them away, I don't say no, we don't need you, we all come, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means, by all methods, by all strategies, in all ways, by all means save some. In verse 23, it tells us, and this I do. 
Not only that I did it in the past today, this I do. Joining hands with them for me limitless liaisons because of the great commission, inviting them to come, accepting them to come. If they're children of God and they're born again because sinners cannot win sinners to the Lord. If they're children of God, this I do. For the gospel said that I might be a partaker thereof with you. That you might be partaker thereof with me. We'll do it together. I said we'll do it together. Number one is the life converting salvation that we have by personal faith. Number two is the love confirming sanctification by purifying faith. And number three is the Lord compelling service by prevailing faith. And I pray this kind of faith that works in us, works on us, and works through us and touches other lives, personal faith, purifying faith, Prevailing faith will be in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. God bless you. God lift you up. God put all his great, all his minds into you. And God transfer the zeal he has given me. The love he has given me. The passion he has given me. That all these many years has not died down. He will give you that kind of love, that kind of passion, that kind of unction, that in this your life, you will demonstrate sanctification, salvation, sanctification, and service unto the Lord. I invite you, don't be different, be like me as I am in Christ, and the grace of God will keep on multiplying in every one of your lives. Where are you? Why don't you stand up and say, Lord, here am I. I'm ready. I've heard. I accept. I believe. I will live like that. Open your mouth and pray.